Okay, Jack, could you tell us a little bit about uh, how you got into the Navy and uh, what the training was like when you first joined up with the Navy? Sure can. Boy, that was a big day for me. Big era, not day, but period. <laughs> Definite period. I was, was in college up in North Georgia, and uh, of course, while I was there, right there in December the 7th, 41 happened. And then, of course, on the radio, and everybody knew about it, and everybody was excited there as we were everywhere. So it was the big moment that got things going there. You knew about the war going on and read the newspapers, but the Pearl Harbor kind of brought it to everybody's attention. And um, so the moment Pearl Harbor happened, um, everybody, everybody in the military and, and the people both were trying to do something about it. And one thing the military did was immediately lower the standards for en enlisting in the military for being a pilot. Up to then it had been two years of college and I had not quite finished two years. And uh, so I was anxious to get that over with. And while I was trying to do that, I believe it was December the 7th and then it was, I believe it was January the 15th that a bus with a Navy team showed up at our college and drove up on the campus and set up shop with a recruiting sign said anybody come on and you don't have to have any college at all just just sign up and, and the army did too they had it later but the navy came first and boy i was down there lickety split and didn't have any trouble getting signed up and they took i believe we had nine of us signed up for the navy program then and i believe about just about a week later they brought in the bus again and carried us to Atlanta to finish the enlistment process, which meant taking a physical and some kind of exams and so forth. So we all did that and spent the night in Atlanta and went through that stuff. And I remember specifically about that it was the first steak I ever had. They, <laughs> they supplied us with a real fine dinner with steak. And I enjoyed that. I said, this is going to be a good life. <laughs> well, it turned out it was pretty good. You ate good on the ship. That was one of my reasons for choosing the Navy. I felt like they were treated you better, and they certainly did. My whole career in the, in the, in the Navy during the war, I, I never had cause to regret being in the Navy and little things like what you eat and where you sleep and that sort of thing. Of course, a poor soldier in the field living in a tent or in the mud and got his K rations to eat and that sort of thing, so it was a, a lot different life. Had you uh, been involved in flying at all up to this point? Had taken any lessons yes. or anything? Uh, a couple of years before that, a friend of mine in my hometown of Marietta and I had begun to hitchhike up to Rome, Georgia, which was about 50 miles from Marietta, as often as we had the money, and takes 15 minutes each because of the expense, that's all we could do. Mm -hmm. And then we'd go home and save up money again. And we had, we had accumulated probably three to four hours, something like that. What kind of plane was that? That was in a Cub, J3, regular J3 Cub. The operator's name was Piggy, Piggy Green, and his name was painted on the top of his hangar. remember that very well. It was a pretty small, uh, messy field right on the river up in Rome, but it was flying. And, uh, so had you soloed yet when you went in the Navy? No. Okay. No, as I said, I only got maybe three or four hours, and this guy, uh, looking back on it, I can imagine very clearly that he wouldn't, he didn't see solo in the future at all. He was just getting our money for whatever time we would pay him. And it was pretty expensive back then. It was 30, well, I believe it was, it was $7 and a half for 15 minutes, hmm. what it cost. So we had to, it was, cost 60 cents to ride the bus from Rome to Marietta. So we had to have seven and a half plus 60 cents because then we could hitchhike up. If we didn't get there, we just didn't get there. But we got up there and we got it flying, and then we had to have fare to get home, be sure we get home for school the next day. So that was kind of effortless, I mean, an effort period to get a little flying time. And I figured out I didn't, I didn't get a lot out of that guy's help. He didn't let you do much. But we, I did get my hands on the airplane, and I knew I knew how to how to fly pretty well. Then I had built so many models and thought about flying, and I had read stick and rudder by then too. Mm -hmm. So I had most of it pretty well figured out. Yeah. And uh, so then the first thing when the Navy 
finished our exams, they, we went home and waited. They said it'd be right away, but it was, I believe it was a month or more before they called up again and said, you come to Atlanta and get on the train. And we rode the train to Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, went to uh, Memphis State College, which had a dormitory assigned to the military. And so we went and stayed in that dormitory and got up early in the morning and went out to their, their gym and did exercises and then stood around for half a day doing whatever we wanted to because they had overlapped classes. It got too many people there. So they ended up with us dividing the day into half a day for academics at the, at the college and the other half a day we'd get on a bus and ride down to south of Memphis about 30 miles to a place called Twinkletown, Mississippi. And that was the airport there and we would spend the other half day flying down there and then we'd go back to the college the next day and back and forth. So we did a half a day program there for six months I guess because it was a three months program and it was the equivalent, the program itself was the equivalent of the private pilot knowledge and, and experience. It's as it's used today very close. It was a little bit different here and there but basically the same thing. They had just taken the FAA's program, CA in those days, CSA's program and enlarged it a little bit and expanded it where they wanted to and turned it over to military there. And that's what for me was CPT, civil pilot training. Okay. And now, at this point in time, the civil meaning you didn't weren't really inducted into the Navy yet. Had you how did that work? Were you committed to going the Navy? Oh or? yes. Yeah. As soon as I went to Atlanta on that first bus and, and got the physical and the other exams and click, hey, I was in the Navy. Oh, I see. Had Were Navy, you actually getting Navy paid? uniform and, and pay. I see. But it wasn't much pay, but I think it was like twelve dollars or something like that. Okay. For whatever we were called, midshipmen or something. I don't know what we were mm -hmm. called, can't remember. But yes, I was in the Navy. I was subject to military discipline, you might say at that point. A few people got in trouble with that idea it wouldn't behave according to the rules. And uh, so the that was C P T program, but the WTS program was what they call the same thing in the Northwest about that time called war training system I guess but uh, they, were, they were running the same program I don't know why the names were different. So how often did you go to for flying lessons then? Did, what did they, you're still in college right? At this point when you were taking the CPT training? No, oh, you got in Memphis State. Oh okay. And I was in that college but it, well, I wasn't going to college I was going to classes that were run by the military. Oh and so they were in, the classes were in the college. I'm sorry. But the classes then were at the college facilities? Yes, uh -huh. I see. They used the classrooms in the college and the gym and so forth, but it was a it was a college program, I'd say, but it was military instructors and oh. military rules, everything. And WTS was the same thing. I think the WTS CPT, as I remember vaguely, was simply a political thing. Whoever started each one, uh -huh. they had they had a, a boss that was uh, the CEO, I guess you'd call it, they and they had some different ones and they were competing a little bit trying to get they take anybody to do anything in those days and get some started. So it was like a real thorough ground school then? Yes, that's exactly what it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, the flying program was just like the private pilot again. We got 35 hours and, and got soloed there and got, I don't remember now, some 10 or 15 hours solo, I don't know what it was. What kind of planes were those? In, in the Cub. Mm -hmm. Were these civilians, were there civilian uh, people running the, air, the oh, maintaining yeah. the airplanes? Uh, my and instructor stuff? was a, a little short, stubby, fat civilian. Okay. So they weren't Navy personnel? No. No, they were military personnel were all getting in camp and getting ready to go overseas. Mm -hmm. And what was left was digging up the, the local people, so to speak. Right. But that was. That was, they had to go somewhere to get started, and that was getting the program started. They had some other airplanes there. They had the UPF Wacos and, and several other airplanes. I can't remember other than that, but uh, they ran uh, the place. I was in the earliest program, the primary program, I call. They also ran a secondary program with the UPFs, and uh, some people that graduated from the primary went right into that and got some more flying time in the UPFs, that sort of thing. But I didn't. I went from, from there. As soon as I finished that, I went to uh, University of Georgia and uh, did what they called, the Navy called a pre-flight program. 
It was pure physical and academic half a day and half a day. Okay. Physical things half a day and in classes learned all the, <clears throat> all the uh, things the Navy thought were important, like the navigation, the particular peculiar to the Navy, and uh, codes. That's where we learned Morse code and so forth. Is that where you had the the thing where you learned uh, aircraft recognition? Yeah, I had recognition there. Tell us, tell tell me about that. Well, you told me one time where they were going to kick you out because you were too good. Well, at it. that was the same thing, recognition, but that was on the later stage. Oh, okay. We could get there if we go right, go right on. No, because you get recognition is one of the subjects there, and. Uh, that was that was a pretty good program for me. We had, I'm gonna I had stop. I'm gonna stop. Pretty good in that program. Enjoyed it and uh, had 400 and I believe 480 some people in the class that I was in going through that pre-flight, and I came out of that at uh, number three position. There were two guys that were scored ahead. They they combined all your physical and academic scores. And just gave you a score for the whole program. Mm -hmm. And so there were two guys that scored better than me, and both of them were, uh, not trying to judge myself, but they were really super guys. They, I, I didn't, I looked at them and I said, I don't know how I got so close. One of them had been, was in the military already, and he just came into the flight program. He was enlisted, and the other one was a Marine that had been in the service before, and he came into the flight program. And they were both big, tough guys. I couldn't even approach to be as strong as they were, yeah. so I, I did pretty good to stay right up with them. <laughs> Enjoyed that program though. And you were flying? What were you flying then? Well, no flying there. Oh, you when That's, you say physical? Yeah, physical. It was like physical, marching, and boxing, stuff. wrestling. Oh, obstacle course, playing football, uh, climbing ropes, all kind of stuff. I see. Real physical. Yeah, real physical. <laughs> I was. I was. I was not not strong or big, but I was I was not small and not weak. I was just in between kind of, but I was agile and strong. I broke the school record there for the straight high jump. What they high jump was just stand standing high jump, I should say. You stand still and stick your hand up and reach up, and jump as high as you can and touch a board up there. Some marks on it to measure how high you get there. And I jumped 44 inches. I had 44 inches on that. <laughs> Which was pretty good because I had been all my all my young life. I'd been running and climbing the mountain where I lived in Marietta, and and then when I went to college at, at Young Harris, I played basketball, and uh, uh, we played in a in a mountain gym that didn't have doors or windows, a little cold and that sort of thing. So it was kind of a tough life. And up there, the Young Harris in the middle of the mountains, so we climbed the mountains there. So my legs were. Exercised, you might say, they're pretty strong. Yeah. So I was I was doing well in those programs, which suited me fine, made me feel good. And then that's about all I can think of about pre-flight, and uh, were sent from there to the the real flying school, which was there again in Memphis. The previous CPT was in Memphis. And we went back to Memphis, and this time went to the Navy base at Memphis, which is north of town. Navy Memphis and there started the primary real Navy primary flight training program which was Stearman's and uh, flew there for I believe three months to finish that program and then I think we delayed about 10 days before we could move on and went from there to Pensacola and started the advanced program well really by name because there were two programs, a basic program, it was primary, then basic, we flew Volte BT-13s. Huh. And uh, in that we learned instrument flying and night flying. Well, at what point in time did you actually quote solo, unquote? Was that when and you were in the J, doing the J-3? That was the J-3, uh, okay. I soloed there. And then you would had to be checked out like in the Stearman when you were flying? Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, and you fly with the instructor for, I think we flew with the instructor for same period, eight hours. Yeah. Anything CPT. particular? Anything particular about the Stearman that you uh, remember as significant or noteworthy? Significance is probably hard to come by. But yeah. I remember a lot about it, but don't know what's worth saying. I enjoyed it. Yeah. It was a good, steady airplane. I guess my main memory of the Stearman, the same as pretty common today, is pretty difficult airplane to keep 
wings level after you're on the ground. Pretty easy to fly, but taxi and rolling out on landing and takeoff were a little bit touchy. Mm -hmm. You look at it today and it doesn't seem hard at all, but it certainly wasn't real easy. And I think that's been the steerman's reputation and most all primary trainers. There are three, three or four other primary trainers that had pretty wide use and they're all about the same, except the PT-19. It was low wing and widespread main gear and mm -hmm. very easy to take, very steady. But the steerman would tip over if you breathe hard when just taxing along. And so, did the, you guys call it the Stearman? Huh? What, it was actually, it was designed by Stearman but built by Boeing. It was the BT-17 or PT-17. PT, the first one, the PT-13. Yeah. Then it went through 14, 15, What did you call 16, them? 17. What, 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 like what would go into your log books or something? I think PT-17 okay. was, was the one we flew at Memphis. And we, I think we called them Stearmans. Did you? Mm -hmm. That's uh, never been called really popular or anything else yeah. as far as I know. But they were one of the, I was going to say one of the main things I remember about them because of that touchy balance on the ground is that the Navy base there had a big warehouse and it was full of steerman parts and uh, mostly wings. They had wings you couldn't believe how many wings they had. And every day we would have to each the periods were say an hour long and after everybody landed at the end of an hour you had ten minutes to land and get out of the way while the next hour period people came in and took off. And um, every day the, all the airplanes were taxiing in the line and there would be anywhere from one to ten with bent wing tips. They would bend up at the at the strut where the end strut went between the wings. They would, the bottom wing would get hit and bend up, break right there and bend up. And they would have that wing changed by the time the next flight was ready to go. <laughs> I mean they were, they would keep them in the air. But we did scratch up a bunch of them. It was understandable because they the Navy field, flying field, had a runway, but it was not, we didn't use a runway. The visiting airplanes might, but we didn't. And the, the, what we used was a, a mat that was circular, and I don't know the exact diameter, but I'm, I'm guessing it was somewhere a thousand feet, maybe 1,100 feet in diameter. It might have been 1,200 feet, but it wasn't too big. And you had to land within that, and there were two of those, one on the, over here, and then there was a taxiway between them that went back to the line. And on that circle was painted a yellow line that was in, in from the edge of the pavement, probably about 30 feet or something like that, that allow you to keep the wheels on the pavement and the wingtip not over that yellow line. The yellow line was where you landed and took off, but the inside was where you taxied. Mm -hmm. So to, to take off on that mat, you taxied out, got the edge of that circle and taxied around the circle till you were downwind, and then you turned and took off across the mat. And when, they, when you put six or seven hundred steermans in the air for, in a ten minute period, you can figure that those two mats were going to have a bunch of airplanes. Every, now when you say every, mat, it was like, what's that? It was they just used called a Marston? It was a paved circle about that big. Oh, it was paved? Paved circle, yeah, asphalt paved. Okay. Uh -huh. And uh, it got very crowded because that yellow line was in it and you had to you couldn't take off your cross the little yellow line, and when you landed, you couldn't cross the yellow line. You had to stop dead because the other airplanes were circling around the edge of that yellow line, going back to the line or coming out, mm -hmm. and you didn't dare go across that. You'd run into them. They were just a steady line. Mm -hmm. And so as you were squeezed into the size of the circle, plus the yellow line, and then it got smaller and smaller. And then you take one more view. When you're on final and you line up the middle, you get the full diameter of it. Mm -hmm. But if you get crowded out, with a bunch of airplanes on each side of you, and you always did. You always looking this way to land. You looked one way once in a while, but you looked this way because other airplanes were just like this all around you. Everybody was coming there. Everybody had to be down and out back to the line in in five minutes, you might say, half the ten minute period. Were you air traffic controlled, so to speak, or was you? You didn't have any traffic control, just the runway and so look just, out. You just watched out for each other and yeah. took turns. And and you ran together. They had quite a few collisions, but. Usually, if they ran together, they just go right to the ground right there and slide a little bit. But mm -hmm. I don't remember anybody getting hurt at that. But they sure tore up a bunch of airplanes. Yeah. And it was a pretty—I'd say it was an excellent training place. If you got through that, you were doing fine. Yeah. And so, anyhow, that was flying steerman's at Memphis, and then went from there to Pensacola to one of the fields. Pensacola had many airports. These were all paved runways and different. 
places around the city of Pensacola. Probably had 15 or 20, I don't know how many they had. And they were for different purposes. And one I went to had BT-13s, and as I said, we learned instrument flying and uh, night flying. It's hold here, let me hit stop.